so um, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, my apologies. Uh, unfortunately, um, we Americans are not very adept at many languages, unlike you Spaniards. So um, you're stuck in English. If I'm speaking too fast or not loud enough, just go slow, slow. I was asked to speak about a document that I, was, um, I helped write called The Vocation of the Business Leader. But if, if it's okay with you, what I'd like to do is speak about the themes of the document, but I hope as it relates to you as students. And I don't know if you're like my students back at home. You look like my students. You look like the age of my students. But many of my students are concerned about the future. They're concerned about where will I go after school? Will I get a job? Will I be forced to go back and live with my parents, which I do not want to, right? And so what is the future? And there's a tendency for my students to act as though it is about what we call sequencing. They say, just let me get a job and make money. And then I'll worry about the idea of a calling or a vocation later. I just need to get a job. This is very dangerous logic. Think about this. What if you did that with food? What if you say, I'm going to eat meat for the next couple of years and just eat meat. And then I'll go to dairy <laughs> two years later. We don't sequence things with food, but we tend to sequence things with other things. And I raise that because everyone in this room, everyone in this room has a view of work. You may not be always very articulate about what that work means to you, but you have a view of work. And that view is very important for you to understand. Now, I suspect because many of you are sitting in the chairs you're sitting in, you've had some great experience of the work. Your parents have taught you about work. You've had good first jobs. You've come from a good family. And there's a lot of great stories that help you come to an understanding of work. But all of us also have maybe not great stories. Stories that actually make it hard for us to look at work in the right way. I'll give you one example. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, in a very difficult neighborhood. And when I was about 16, a couple years younger than you were, I was walking, um, I was ready to leave the house. And my father, both my parents are from Ireland. So I'm a first generation American. And my father, who was having some troubles with me at the time, said to me, he said, Michael, in his Irish accent. He said, Michael, Michael, you be a good boy, Michael. And I said, sure, Dad, whatever, as a teenager would say. He said, but Michael, Michael, if you can't be good, you be careful. I said, all right, I think I can do that. Well, an unfortunate event happened to me that night, and my father had to pick me up from a Chicago police station. I'll spare you the details about why he had to pick me up from this police station. But he walked into the police station, he looked at me and he said, Michael, Michael, I think you better just be good, Michael, right? And I say the story because we tend to think about life as just about being careful. So I don't know if you have this in your country, but in our country, we have designated drivers, safe and careful drivers who take home drunk drunk and stupid friends. We have a phenomenon called safe sex, somehow thinking that non-productive, non-diseased sex is somehow gonna be make up for its unitive and procreative meaning. We have a school system that's constantly focusing students to get the right grades, the right scores, and they've lost the love of learning. And also that we have career strategies of people saying how I can go from here to there to get this job, to get that career, and they've lost the love of work. That is, we could be so focused on being careful, and we've lost sight of what it means to be good. 
And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. What does that mean for your work? Yes, you got to get that first job. Yes, you want to be careful. But that can distract you from the deeper realities and the deeper meaning about what your life is demanding from you. So there are three things I want to do in this talk and ask three big questions for you. The first question is, what am I working for? Most of you will work way too much to deprive yourself of a good answer to that question. You are moving into a global economy. And that global economy is demanding a lot out of you. Because before, you were only competing with about 2 billion people. Today, you're competing with 6 billion people. You're in a different era. And you're going to work a lot more than your parents have. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But here's the thing. In order to get a good answer to that question, you cannot get it just by asking the question, what am I working for? You have to ask yourself a second question. And this is an odd question, but it's an important question. What am I resting in? Now here's where the theology comes in a little bit. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you and I are made not only to work, you and I are made to rest. And what do I rest in is the question we need to ask. Now, when you can put that question, what am I working for? What am I resting in? And put them together, you now get the deeper question, what am I living for? And while you may not always want to say that's a big question, I'll deal with that later, that's the wrong attitude. These are the questions you have to deal with now. Don't wait. Deal with them now. Particularly at a university like this is exactly the place you want to be dealing with it. So these are the three questions I'd like to talk with you today. As an academic, I was both in the business school and also in the, in the program we call Catholic Studies. We love a matrix. Now let me make a few, I'm gonna use this matrix. It's my tool. You are way too complicated to be put in boxes. So this thing is not going to tell us all about life, right? But it's a tool to help us kind of think about it. And as a tool, it, I have a thesis. And I talked about this with some of your faculty today. And here's my thesis. You and I will never get work right. We'll never get business right. We'll never get leadership right unless we get leisure right, <coughs> unless we get rest right, all right? That's the thesis. So let's see if we can work that out. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start right down here, and I'm going to go give you three versions. How do people look at their work, their leisure, and how do they put it together? And then afterwards, hopefully, we can have a conversation. Make sense? All right. First view. Some people look at their work as a job. I told you, I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a blue-collar neighborhood, working-class neighborhood. And if they knew I was here talking to you about work as a, as a calling or a vocation, they'd say, Mike, you've been in the ivory tower too long. It's about the money. Work is about economic returns. Matter of fact, there was a columnist in Chicago, and he once said this. He says, listen, if work is so great, how come they have to pay us to do it? Let's get real. Actually, if you ever come to the United States and come to Minneapolis, where I, co where I come from, there's a little diner, a little restaurant called L's Diner. And if you look into the, where they do the cooking, there's a sign and it says this, there's no fulfillment here. You don't come to work for fulfillment. You just come to work for a paycheck. This is how people who look at their work as a job looks at work. It's simply about the money. Now the question, of course, is, why do people look at work this way? And there's lots of reasons. Well, one reason actually has to do with how we look at our rest or our leisure, particularly how we look at our leisure as amusement. I come from the entertainment capital of the world, Hollywood. It's our largest export in the United States. We don't export manufacturing goods anymore. We just export entertainment. 
right? And we love to be entertained and we love to entertain the world. This is why some of the richest people in the world are entertainers. We love the entertainment. And we often is captured by, do you guys still listen to Billy Joel? No? Billy Joel? He wrote a song called The Piano Man. And in there he has a great line. He says, they know it's been me they've been coming to see to forget about life for a while. Leisure as amusement is escape. I don't encounter reality, I flee reality. Or if we get a little bit more philosophical about it, a man named Jacques Rouleau, a French philosopher, put it this way. He said, instead of being the moment when we rediscover ourselves, thinking about who we ought to be, leisure is the moment when amusements succeed to the maximum in making us forget. Do you know what the word etymology is? Etymology is how do you understand the root of a word? The word amusement comes from the Greek word muses. And the muses were the goddesses of the liberal arts. They were meant to refresh us, to recreate us, to help us see a larger reality. Well, when you put the word a ah in front of a word, it negates it in the English language. So I'm a, if I'm a theist, I believe in God. If I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. Well, if you look in the English Oxford Dictionary under the word amusement, Here's the, dic here's the definition. Amusement, to stare stupidly at something. <laughs> now this is my wife's description of me watching television, <laughs> right? But this is how we often see amusement. Matter of fact, most of our advertising industry is based on this. I was in Chicago a couple of years ago and I was reading what they call the US Day Today. It's a, it's, a, it's a newspaper. And in there, there was an ad for a chain of hotels that said this, the weekend getaway. Your body checks in and your mind checks out. This is the weekend in the United States. And we go to Las Vegas, and you know the tagline of Las Vegas, right? Whatever happens in Vegas, stays, stays in Vegas. Vegas. There are some universals. Even in Spain, <laughs> I can get you to say that. That's beautiful, right? By the way, Whoever said that should get sued. Because you know what? The only thing that stays in Vegas is your money. Everything else comes right back with you. It doesn't stay in Vegas. But this idea of the weekend has also impacted how we understand celebrations. The commercialization of Christmas, the trivialization of Easter, the utter decadence of Mardi Gras, and then, do you have Halloween here, right? The ghoulishness of Halloween. Halloween, by the way, has become our second most product, most expensive holiday, right? Here are these days which were meant to what? They were meant to recreate us. They were meant to see a larger horizon. They are now become frenetic acts of consumption, right? So what does this tell us? What this tells us is that when I look at my work as a job and my leisure as an amusement, life is simply a series of gratifications. And thus we fall into this problem of consumerism. This, by the way, is a term that Pope Francis has been talking a lot about and he's very concerned about it. And he says, and this he's largely, he, he, he doesn't like the United States, but I think this applies to Europe as well. He says consumerism has created a great deal of cultural poverty. We in the West, who have all the money, are often sometimes the most impoverished, culturally and spiritually. So, this view. What's interesting is this becomes the focus, amusement. But let me tell you about what's happened in the United States. This has become the focus, but what this demands is what? Money. And thus, people are working more and spending less time in amusement. There's a woman named Juliet Shore wrote a book called The Overworked American. And she says, in the United States, we work more hours than anybody in the Western industrialized country, yet we consume more than anybody. And thus, we got the work-spend cycle going on. We work more and we have less leisure, even though we see our focus in terms of leisure. View number one. View number two. Some people see their work as a career. 
Matter of fact, I often see my work as a career because I like my work. I get psychological satisfactions from my work. I enjoy my work. I love teaching. I love research. I love all this. And I meet with a lot of business executives and they love their work. Right? But what's interesting is that often happens is look at the word career. Where does it come from? It doesn't come from the word care. It actually comes from the word car. The career is the automobile, the self-driven vehicle that gets us from one to here to there. That is, the careerist is not money mad. The careerist is achievement oriented. They want to achieve things because that's where they find their identity. So why would somebody look at their work as a career? Lots of reasons. But a lot of it has to do with how they understand their leisure. Not as an amusement, but leisure as utility. Now, I don't know if this is true for this university, but in my university, when it comes to education, they see it simply justified based on its instrumental value to career. So our students will say, so like, why do I got to take philosophy? Like, why do I got to take theology, art? What is it going to do for my career? And thus, everything is instrumentalized to the career. By the way, in the Christian tradition, and the Western, Greek, Roman, Christian tradition, education was always understood not simply about getting you a job, but helping you see a larger reality. Matter of fact, the very word, the very word for leisure in Latin comes from the word scola, which is where we get the same word for school. So I always try to convince my students they're at leisure. It doesn't work. Right? Now, this is not only true for school, this is actually true for all of leisure. Matter of fact, rest is often justified in order to sharpen the saw in order to become more productive. We see everything in terms of that. Let me give you an example of this. There's a Hungarian psychologist, his name is Sandor Ferenzi, and he coined the term Sunday neurotic, Sunday neurosis. It's a psychological disease for those of you who might be in, psycho in psychology. And here's what he says. Why is it he was looking at all these patients he had? Many of them often feel a great deal of boredom, unrest, unease, anxiety, a kind of low-grade depression. When? <coughs> On Sundays. Why? Well, the obvious answer, they have to go back to work on Monday. But here's what Ferenzi said. He says, actually, that's not the reason. Here are people who tried to rest, they don't know how to rest, and they got themselves into knots. And thus, they're unease, right? They don't know how to rest. So what does that tell us? What that tells us is that often, if I see my work as a, as a career, and if I see my leisure as the kind of utility to get to that career, I define who I am in terms of achievements. And thus, we run into the problem of careerism. I'm more concerned about what I do and less concerned about who I am. First question in the United States people will ask you is, what do you do? Right? And we excuse all sorts of behaviors by people's achievements. There's a guy named Jack Wells, the CEO of, of General Electric. As somebody once said, excuse the language, Jack Wells, he's a real asshole, but look what he did. Steve Jobs, same thing. He's a real jerk, but look what he achieved. It's an interesting thing. What will we do? What will we excuse in terms of people's achievements? Let me give you a case of this. You may not know this man, but his name was Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca was one of the great CEOs in America of the Chrysler Corporation. And in the 1980s, he turned, the company went into bankruptcy. He turned it around to make it one of the most successful car companies in the United States. He retired in the early 1990s. 
And when he retired, he was, on, he was on the cover of the Fortune magazine with this caption, how I flunked retirement. The article's fascinating. He says in the article that his last two or three years of retirement was more stress-filled than his 47 years in the auto industry. That's quite a statement. This is a man who knew exactly who he was, or at least he thought he knew who he was, as the CEO of the Chrysler Corporation, but this was a man who was lost in his retirement. An economic giant on one level, and yet a spiritual midget on another level. One can only admire, however, that he had the guts to confess this within Fortune magazine. So what does that tell us? What that tells us is that we have a problem. The problem is that we do not do a very good job talking about our work and our leisure and how we put it together. Let me put it in a very simple way. If you look at your work as a job, you've underinvested your life in work. You're expecting too little out of your work. If you work, if you see your work as a career, you have overinvested your life in your work because that's all you see. So the question then is, how do you begin to understand your work and your leisure and how you put it together? And so let me begin to start to conclude about what the way I would think would be a way to do that. To see one's work as a vocation. Again, etymologies are so important. The word vocation comes from the Latin word to call. That one is called to something. And in, in more specifically, you and I are called to give of ourselves. Let me express three ways in, in which this vocation is played out. The first one is the most general one. You and I are called to be human. And you and I are at our best as human beings in light of this quote. A person cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. You and I are always at our best, not when we're calculating, not when we're scheming, not when we're figuring out our own particular, maximizing our own self-interest. You and I are always at our best when we look at the other and we say, what can we do for you? Rather than sit there with our own minds and only think about ourselves. That's when we're at our best. That's when we're fully human. And that's universal. Now, Within the Catholic tradition, they talk about other ways of understanding the call. They were called to a state of life. In the Catholic tradition, we talk about the priesthood, religious life, and the lay life. I expect most of us here will be called to the lay life. But even here, one has to be clear. For example, I have a friend of mine. He has a very large family. And he's also a teacher. And he says, my wife only has one husband. My children only have one father. My students have other teachers. I can never sacrifice my vocation, my call to marriage, to my work, because of the special call one makes to kids and to spouses. So in even the state of life, there's a kind of ordering. But with that said, we are also called to work. Matter of fact, John Paul II wrote a wonderful document on work and he says this, he says, work constitutes one of the fundamental dimensions of our earthly existence and of our vocation precisely because our work allows us to express our gifts to others. That's what work does. You have gifts in you. And those gifts can be used for other people. And that's why the idea of a vocation as giving, and there's a deep logic of gift that, under, that underlies that. I'm going to talk about the Christian tradition in a moment, but let me, I come from the United States, let me talk about Native Americans, the Indians. They get this in a very interesting way. You may not know the folklore, but when the Puritans, when, when the Puritans came to the United States, they met these things, they met Native American, we called them Indians, right? And when they met each other, they exchanged gifts. And then they went away. And when they came back and saw each other, the Native Americans noticed that the, the white guys still had the gifts that they gave them. And they asked for those gifts back. 
which is where we get this derogatory term in the United States called Indian givers. Do you know that phrase? Indian givers, you probably don't. Indian giver is when I give something to you and then you ask for it back, right? We think that's really bad, but that's not what was going on. Native Americans understood that when you give a gift to somebody, that gift is not for you. That gift is to go through you to another. Every gift you have is not for you. And here's the thing, if you only use your gifts for yourself, you will corrupt yourself. It's called the law of the gift. That's how you get corrupted. The only way your gifts can be, fulfill you is they go through you and they are for others. That's the logic of the gift. So, in terms of business, in terms of working, what are the, what are the ways in which we give to ourselves? Think about a business. It creates, it makes goods which are truly good and services which truly serve. It creates good work that helps people to foster gifts and talents. And it creates good wealth, sustaining wealth and distributing it justly. That's what a business does when it's doing it for others. Now, there's more to be said about this. But let me highlight a problem. And here's, well, let me highlight my problem. I get up early in the morning and I work hard. I have five children, I have a great family, a great wife, and I love my kids. I go to church, I work in my community, and I give all day long. But then something starts to happen. I start to saying, well, why aren't they working as hard as I am? And I say to my, you know, I say, you know, why am I putting in 60% but my wife's only putting in 40%? By the way, I never say that to my wife, I just think it. <laughs> I've learned a few things, right? But what happens is I start getting this kind of attitude that actually starts to debilitate me. <coughs> and I think I get frustrated with everybody else. And I say that is because of this. It, it, there's a Latin aphorism that goes like this. Nemo dot quad non habit. You cannot give what you do not have. And if all you do is work, you will become resentful, you will become bitter, and you will feel like you didn't get your due. That is why work as a vocation needs leisure, not as an amusement, not as utility, but as contemplation. And this becomes the hardest thought to get in this talk, and it's this. Leisure is about an act of receivement. It's about a contemplative outlook in the world that one receives it. It's a very famous theologian, and he put it this way. He says, the most profound thing about your life will not come from what you achieve, but what you receive. Not what you do, but what you accept. Often that is sickness, it could be failure, it could be listening to the critique of another, when you can actually listen and receive what they've given you. Let me highlight three uh, habits of this. The first is the habit of silence or solitude, daily silence. I don't know about you, but it's easy to get silence out here. How do you get silence in here? How do you shut these thoughts off? By the way, I have all these thoughts going on in my head all the time, that I'm the unappreciated genius at my university. If people would just listen to me. I have debates with my colleagues in my head all the time. By the way, I win every debate. Never lose a debate, right? The question is, when do I shut the tape off? Because here's the thing, all these tapes in your head, they create a false self. You think you have an image of who you are, but you don't. And the thoughts in your head often create a bad image. You have to learn to shut the tape off to hear what you need to hear. It's a very important, very important. By the way, well, let me go to the second habit, the habit of celebration, the Lord's Day. Taking a day off, this is a tough one, and I'm sure it's probably even tougher here in Spain, right? But in United, this is where you need to look to the Jews. 
because the Jews do a much better job on the Sabbath than most Christians. They take it seriously. By the way, here's a challenge to you. I challenge you to become a techno-Sabbatarian. I love that phrase. A techno-Sabbatarian. That is, on this, if, if, if you are a Christian or you're on that, if you take Sundays off, take a break from your technology. Turn off your phones. Turn off your computers. Here's one of the biggest interesting problems in the United States. It's called internet anxiety disorder. People can't put their phones down as it's displayed in this room, right? It's a very interesting phenomenon. Phone, by the way, is a very important tool, but it's only a tool. The Sabbath is always a disconnect from production and consumption, disconnect from technology. And by the way, if you can't, the technology owns you and you don't own it, right? And lastly, the question of the habit of service, of going to the margins. We have to be connected to the poor. Not in a way that we do things for the poor, but that we are with the poor. And this could be the elderly, the handicapped, the lonely, right? Any of those. Now, these three habits. Let me give a story about this woman, who I'm sure many of you know who she is, Mother Teresa. I met Mother Teresa twice in my life and once was in Calcutta, India. And I was giving a talk in Calcutta, and the, my host, who was Hindu, knew I was Catholic, and he says, would you like to go meet Mother Teresa? I said, sure. So we went down to the mother house, and we walked in, and there's Mother Teresa. And my Hindu friend drops to his knees, and he's trying to kiss Mother Teresa's feet. And Mother Teresa's trying to pick him up, and he's trying to kiss the feet. And there's this wrestling match going on right in front of me, right? And honest to goodness, the only thought I had in my mind was this. God, she has big feet. <laughs> and boy, is she old. And gosh, is she short. And can't you think of something more profound? I mean, here I am sitting in the front of the icon of holiness. And all I could think about were feet. But we had a wonderful 20-minute conversation. And as we're leaving, she says to us, she says, I'd like to give you my business card. She had a bit of a smirk on her face, a bit of a smile. And there was no phone number, no email, but this was what was on her business card. And it was this. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. Mother Teresa was a very busy woman. She had operations in over 80 countries. She started her day not with her agenda, she started her day in silence to receive that allowed her to work in a way that was profound. So what does that tell us? Let me begin to wrap up. If I can see my work as a vocation and my leisure as contemplation, I then get the ingredients for real integrity. Again, the word integrity is how do I become whole? Because I am divided. And in that, how does one become a leader with integrity? How do you become a contemplative practitioner? How do you have great resolve? And by the way, let me be very clear. This talk is not about taking it easy. You are going to go into a marketplace that's going to demand a lot out of you. You have to have great resolve. If you want to be a great leader, you need great resolve. But that's not all you need. You also need this capacity to receive. And that's where humility comes in. That's where listening comes in. That's where receiving comes in. That is what makes you a great leader, right? And there's a guy named Jim Collins who wrote a book called Good to Great in the Harvard Business Review that basically said the same thing. So where does that put us? Where that puts us is a full matrix. Let me say three things and then I'll stop. First, we're all over the place. This is not, this is not explaining reality. It's just a tool, and it will fall apart, right? Second point, there's nothing wrong with work as a job. I work for money. I've gone into my academic vice president twice, and I've gotten two raises, and I'm very happy about it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to live better. There's nothing wrong with a career. There's nothing wrong when someone says, you've done great work, we're gonna give you a better title because to display what you've been doing. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's the problem. 
They're simply too small for the human spirit, though. They're too small. You can't grow in a job or career. You will stagnate. That's why the vocation is always something that's bringing us larger. The same thing with leisure. There's nothing wrong with the amusements. There's nothing wrong with you guys wanting to get a better job. They're simply too small for the human spirit. You can't grow in that kind of leisure. That's why contemplation is so important. And lastly, integrity. I work with a lot of business people. And when a business person tells me they have integrity, I get really nervous. This is not something I have. This is something that's given to me, right? Because I can't achieve it on my own. And that's at the heart of the talk. It's gotten very warm in here, and you've done a great job sticking with me. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, well how about this? Let me, uh, let me end with one more thought. Um, and uh, uh, at my university, um, the University of St. Thomas. St. Thomas was one of the great Italian medieval thinkers. And what he was always trying to do is bring things together. And there's a man in that tradition by the name of John Henry Newman. It was interesting, I just saw this picture of John Henry Newman sitting right here. And Newman was a synthetic thinker. He was a person always trying to bring things together. And he wrote very profoundly on these questions. And what I'd like to do is end with a quote, which actually gets at the bigger picture of what this talk is about. And here's what Newman says. He says, God created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me, which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I never may know it fully in this life, but I shall be told it in the next. Somehow I am necessary to his purposes. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I end with this quote for this reason. God created us to do some definite service. He's committed you to do some definite service. And it's not always easy to know exactly what that is, particularly at this age at which you're at. Because what you've got to try to figure out is what are my gifts? What are my interests? And then, of course, can those gifts be fitted in within the marketplace I'm about to enter into? That's not easy. But here's the thing. I have gifts, but I have to do it with others. It is a service. It is to be done with another person. And here's the challenge. A lot of people go through life, and they often wake in we call midlife crisis because they haven't thought about it. This is the time to think about it. Because what you're about to embark on is going to have serious implications for the rest of your life. And to think about it just as a job or just as a career cheapens life rather than ennobles it. But thank you, and I appreciate your time. Take care. Thank you.